Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Unbox Lunch. I'm Jenny Williams, Associate Director for the Archives of American Art, and I'm thrilled that you're joining us for lunch. A few housekeeping items before we get started. At any time during the webinar, you can submit your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Closed captioning is available. You can access captions by clicking the CC button on the right hand of the control panel. Now, I'd like to introduce and welcome the Archives of American Arts Head of Collecting, Josh T. Franco. Hey, Josh. Hi, Jenny. Thanks for the introduction and um, getting everyone oriented. Um, hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Early, happy Juneteenth. Uh, coming up on Monday. So yeah, I'll get started because um, these always fly by. So today we're featuring right behind me are some of them, the, pro the records of the new arts program. This is a two day residency program um, in Cutstown, Pennsylvania that was founded in 1974 uh, by James Carroll, um, who continues to run it to this day. Uh, and um, yeah, has been, it's been really great to get to know uh, James and the people who work with him over the past few years. Um, you know, this is a great example of institutional records. Uh, besides individuals' papers at the archives, we do collect the records of institutions, uh, in this case, a gallery and residency program. Um, they're amazing because they capture really whole worlds. So the artist files, for instance, which we'll get into, um, as well as some other publications produced by James and the, res and the program, um, really show you like a whole world. And here that world is very much um, geared towards New York, uh, New York City. Um, until the last few years, there was a direct bus from New York City to Cutstown that really facilitated um, some of the most cutting edge avant-garde artists working in the 1970s uh, up to today um, to come to this residency uh, for which James offered an honorarium and um, it did come with a sort of stipulation that the residents uh, make themselves available to community members um, to be there for consultations. So communities, Cutstown and other places where New York's program took its um, method and its group uh, would sign up for these spots um, to get an hour or so um, with these amazing artists who would be brought by NAP. Um, the artists got out of it uh, often working in the gallery space or working with the support of the team in other places like a church in Cutstown um, and other sites arranged by James. So yeah, just really incredible. We'll, um, we can get into the material um, as a way to just, yeah, start seeing things. So I'll say one of the biggest challenges of this collection, oh, it's a very heavy box, um, was the audio visual content. So the New Arts Program team led by James did this really amazing job uh, documenting everything that happened. And so, you know, that's a double-edged sword. The good side is that you have, I'm gonna show you, let's see if we can angle this. So this is one box that is entirely full of mostly cassette tapes in this case, but beta, VHS, um, and CDs are also part of the collection. So it was such a sort of vast proposal of audiovisual uh, material that it uh, reached a level where it made sense to invite uh, Mackenzie Beasley, our audiovisual archivist here, to go with me to Cutstown and assess the collection there. Um, from like a, she could understand if the material would need any significant preservation. And together, me sort of assessing the content, her assessing the physical state of the media. Um, decide it, pared down what would come to the archives. Um, so it was a really a, an intentional selection process done between me, Mackenzie, and the team at the New Arts Program. Um, everything's wonderfully labeled. So here's a cassette tape, Judith Stein, whose papers are here at the archives from 1995. Also, let me see, I know there's some, ah, uh, yes. So Philip Glass has been a close associate of New Arts Program um, almost since its, in, since its inception. Um, as well, Allen Ginsberg as well has uh, been a repeated visitor and performer. Um, so yeah, and this is audio, this is video, it's a super HG. 
So yeah, some amazing full class, Ellen Ginsberg performances, Trisha Brown. Um, I'll just read you the first three years of residence, the list I have the site up over here. The very first resident of New York's program was David Rabinowich, um, followed by Bruce Boyce, Philip Glass, Yvonne Rayner, Steve Reich, uh, then folks like Robert Mangold, Robert Pincus Witten, Richard Serra, um, and it just goes on like that for the entirety of the program, and it's a really amazing place. Um, if you go to Cutstown, you go to the New York's program space and gallery, you'll see on the floor just what looks like some very thick black paint and lines. And eventually it becomes apparent that this is a Keith Haring mural on the floor. Um, Keith Haring, as many of you may know, uh, was from Cutstown, Pennsylvania, and um, initiating from there, uh, had this ongoing relationship with the New Arts program, would contribute to their fundraisers by designing t-shirts or works, donating works, and um, was always a great advocate. Um, and I'll say if James is on, feel free to drop any corrections or additional info in the chat. Um, also, I want to acknowledge Patricia Goodrich, who I believe is here as well, um, who also works with and for James, um, is an amazing artist herself and poet and really made this all operate very smoothly. Um, you know, she was who I communicated with, made arrangements with. And yeah, very integral part. Um, we're gonna get into some papers, but I do want to screen share because I just, there's um, documentation of New Arts Alive, which was a local cable channel uh, show created by uh, New Arts Program. Um, is a presence in the papers as well. And there's a little clip on YouTube here uh, where Patricia is in the role of artist um, talking to James, who you'll see as host. So I'll just play a second of that. All of this stuff. And then they start a conversation, much like we're having with each other. Um, can I read something to you? Sure. Okay. Th this might explain it. The, I write poetry too, and my poems come together sometimes like my boxes do so if if you hear something that like what is she talking what does that got to do with anything in the poem don't worry about it just go with the flow because that's just in the end it works and this is partly why i make the boxes there are things of which i cannot write i don't want to be the new chalk across the blackboard or the toenail clipper of a dog, one that trims too near. There are travels I cannot translate except through paint or wooden boxes, contents pieced together to solve a puzzle I don't recognize. People who may seem generic except through portraits gleaned as we pass each other on cratered roads or crowded marketplace. Of each, I breathe the memory, though I doubt my presence registered any more than a bottle of milk on a white shelf, a plum fallen from a tree, purple skin split, then crushed by a cart pulled by a red tasseled horse. So I'll just stop us there, but I just wanted to give you um, a sense of the sort of spaces James made over the years at New uh, Arts Program, let the um, a really kind of interdisciplinary space. You saw poetry there, but also, and I mentioned Philip Glass and Ginsburg, so for music and performance. Um, John Cage was also a presence there. So a really experimental uh, interdisciplinary space. Also dancers, Yvonne Rayner, Trisha Brown, um, uh, I believe Bill T. Jones at some point, but you know, correct me in the chat, um, James or Patricia, if you are listening. Um, so yeah, just an amazing space. It's been really wonderful to get to know. Um, I'll pull out another box while I keep chatting. Josh, as you do that, I just wanted to highlight those of you that joined us for last month. There were um, great communication between the Grinsteins and Philip Glass in, in that collection. So it's interesting to see the carryover into this week, uh, to this month's programming. Oh, yeah, that is, that's a really nice connection. Yeah. Um, so artist files, these are also incredibly valuable and a core part of this collection. So these often contain um, the, let me get my box marker, 
the proposed the initial project proposal to new arts program based on which James would decide you know to invite that person um, and also then you get documentation of those projects after they happen so diagrams installation plans for the new arts gallery in Cutstown. Um, so here's a letter from James to Pincus Witten. Just reminding him of his visit to Cutstown in this two day model, 16th and 17th of September. Yeah, there it's cleared up. You are to talk about what is important to you. It is hoped that a dialogue from the students will follow. Right. And I'll find a one with, um, saw one earlier with the great diagram of the. Here we go. So this is Elizabeth Quizgard's file, much thicker as you can see. And yeah, this is the kind of thing we love. So here's an installation plan based on uh, the layout of the gallery. And the note here attached to it says, this piece will be in the show hung horizontally on your 16 foot wall. And then another note I can't read, but somebody can spend some time digging into that handwriting. Oh, and here's images of the painting. Pretty incredible. Oh, and then more instructions, this time handwritten and drawn uh, for that installation. Uh, let's pull another one. We have a, a note from a participant that Liz lived in the neighbor um in her neighborhood growing up and had oh. her painted with beautiful colors from Catherine Cohen. That's nice. Oh, here's Dorothea Rockburn. Let's see what she did during her residency. So at some point, James sent her something related to John Cage, which she thanks him for. This is a um, printed out email. And you can see this relationship went on a while because the email is from 2009, but there's also correspondence here from 1977. And I'll read to you. Uh, oh, this is a statement for a project, it looks like. The interrelation of intellect and feeling in the work may have had different emphases at different times with different works, but there has been a consistency of consciousness. So the following line of Sartre's found in Rockburn's diary and quoted elsewhere in reference to her golden section painting still applies. The quote is, a feeling is not an inner disposition, but an objective transcending relation, which has as its object to learn what it is. This aptly describes her intention, uh, the intensive search for the kind of color relationship she wants in the new works. That's kind of very nice and very um, substantive statement. And then there's just very helpful things like, you know, announcements of programs for the Cutstown public and for the college that James was at at the time. And a couple of slim catalogs. Yeah, amazing. And then James working out her bio for her introduction or some text, I assume. Um, but again, these are 76, 77 things here. Uh, Rockborn, of course, is a well-known artist. Uh, and that's one of the special things too. So many artists who 
went on to be very successful, um, had these very early moments here. Um, and I admit I was not aware of New Arts program before uh, Patricia and James reached out a few years ago about the records. And um, it's just, that's, that's, I think that's what we specialize in at the archives is um, making it possible to see things that were going on that uh, for whatever reason did not um, gain kind of notoriety. Um, so, you know, I think I'm really thinking about New Arts Program and it's very much in the same context and level as more known places like Skohegan or Haystack School um, or Penland, uh, these major artist residencies. And maybe it's because those last so much longer, you know, you're at Skohegan all summer, uh, maybe because they have um, sort of unique names, whereas New Arts Program uh, maybe just doesn't stick in people's heads. But the impact it's had is like very, very clear when you dig into the records um, and when you understand its place uh, in many, many artists' early moments in their careers. And then what's nice here too is oftentimes the archives are sort of raw material that scholars then use to produce more polished texts or exhibitions um, or other kinds of documents. Uh, but New Arts Program sort of did that work as well. James sort of did it himself. Um, so every residency project got these really well-produced notebooks. You can see this whole box is just these and there's many more boxes like this. Um, so they're this kind of amazing complement to the raw files because uh, they're bound, they have statements. This one contains an interview. <laughs> Um, being interviewed by James. I'm just going to start because I saw a funny phrase. Um, I think James says they look like fudge sickles. And Lisa Eshelman Foster is the artist here says, I mean, they have a stick quality. Uh, James says, and then she says they could be feathers. They do have a stick. When I work in my studio, I put the music on and I listen to music and I kind of go into an unconscious consciousness, which is where I pull a lot of images from. I can't really tell you that this is someone I know, and I can't tell you why he has feathers on his head or why he has an orange hairdo like that, but I definitely say he, so he's definitely a man. This one is not political. Uh, so that's really fascinating. This is uh, perhaps an image of the artist, really fun one. Um, and I think there are samples of the, yeah, there's some samples of the work. Oh, and it's possible this is, what they were discussing that might be the feather. Um, so yeah, these booklets are amazing. It's like a whole little publishing house sort of within the papers that includes these interviews uh, where you learn like what you just heard. This artist uh, has music in the studio playing, so it's helpful to understand the context in which a piece is made. Let me pull out another one. So then here's another publication, um, not about an individual, but about an event, the Salon Exhibition of Small Works, which happens annually at New Arts Program. It lists all the artists, has statements by the artist. No images in this one. Yeah, so these are all the small works catalogs. So those are great. Okay, I need to make some room. Oh. So James himself is an artist. And I need to move this. Um, he's very humble about it, but. Uh, we made sure that that practice is on the record as well. So if you go into the back of New Arts Program behind the gallery, you're essentially entering James's studio. So you see his paintings and drawings and materials um, everywhere there. So this includes some slides. And there is a basically a full catalog of James's work. I wonder if these will translate. I wonder if I can do... Yeah, okay, you need a light table really, but 
So you can see James's work, which is very, um, there's a lot of geometry involved, a lot of very interesting mark making. Okay, here's some photographs. This, let's see if these are annotated inside. Some kind of site specific installation project. Interesting. Oh, here's a label. Okay, so the label says James Carroll. Things made to be painted, 1987, wood, screws, and acrylic. The surface of this piece is activated by one's perceptions of surface and form. The illusion of solidness and depth are activated by the hue of the paint. So this is great documentation of what was um, you know, definitely an ephemeral project. Josh, we have a question about the um, processing of this collection and when a finding aid might be available. I think uh, people have um, some interest in those booklets that you um, uh, well, yeah, so it's, you know, it's the collection is deeded in accession now, so it's accessible as far as processing. It's a really big collection, about 60 linear feet, so I'm not going to hazard a guess, I'm, you know. So it's available if you want to come look at it. Um, there's not a finding aid to orient you, so you'd have, it's a little, little bit of work to get to what you want. Um, but yeah, I, you know, with couple of years, I would safely guess, but um, we'll see. I think the real challenge, although again, Mackenzie, our AV archivist is um, very, very good at what she does. Uh, and we got ahead of this by going out there and doing some um, refining before things even got shipped to DC. Um, and I did notice going through the boxes this morning that some of those pieces are already barcoded. Um, so they're clearly being, um, you know, that kind of bit of processing is happening. The AV is definitely the most urgent part to deal with here, although it's all very in very good shape, but that material sort of naturally decays. Um, so it's important to address it, digitize it as early as possible. Um, so that's underway. And yeah, let me get some more artist files. It's a very dense collection like heavy. So get Tom Doyle's folder here. Some examples of work. And then let's see if we can find out what was being proposed in Cutstown. Okay, so he was there in 2001. There's documents like the certificate of insurance for the work here. Oh, and then a copy of uh, the interview. Uh, with, I assume, James. And here's Doyle talking about his sort of early, early formation. So he says, that's right. Then I went to a different town to high school. It was there that I first started thinking about being a sculptor. Actually, I took a class with the football coach. All I did in high school was play football, pretty much. I didn't study art. Well, I took a class with him and everyone else was making lamps and all that stuff. And I just carved because I always sort of carved and made things. And James asked, what did you carve with? He says, with a knife. 
uh, and they talk about that for a while. Um, so that's great. And I'll say our oral history team might be relieved to know that this contains so many interviews because there's just so many great artists like Tom Doyle, who, um, you know, the, the list of oral histories we want to do and need to do grows every single day. Um, and so when we find that other people have done a little bit of that work uh, and donated it, it's very helpful. Um, so it's nice to have, you know, we now know that we have Tom Doyle speaking about his own work um, on the record in this collection. So that's, yeah, just a great asset. It's shared labor. And in this last few minutes, I will, this is uh, Constant, Constance de Jong's file. The first date I see is 1977, so very early resident. Uh, her CV from that time is here. A great photo. Ooh, lovely. Yeah. Oh, and then this is, um, I've seen this before. These are the uh, sign up sheets for people. Like I said, it was sort of a requirement of the, the residency that the artists make the scheduled time for people to come from the local community and spend time with them. Um, so this is the sign up sheet for that with Dijon. And you can see this is clearly a copy that the space is left blank and you just fill in the name of um, whoever's coming that time. And then here's a letter from Dijon to James, really discussing specifics of the work. Here, James enclosed tape is queued for three quarter inch copying. Time index is in tape box if technicians need to requeue. One question, can we have a monitor or this on the set for the show? I'd like to do an excerpt of relatives, um, which requires tape to play on a monitor me to stand sit next to it. I'd like to include relatives um, if possible. So you just get a sense of that back and forth in the formation of making a show. Um, oh, here's the, I guess they did it because here's the mailer. So they were able to do relatives of performance by, um, oh, Constance Jong and Tony Orsler. That's great. So again, very experimental format, spoken text and video on stage. Will you show us the other? Was there something on the other side? Oh, uh, yeah, there's a nice buffalo. Oh, okay, it's a. <laughs> it's yeah. just a oh, that's exciting, but nice. Um, here's a postcard to from, from Dijon. Dear James, I will be in Vancouver 5th of February to 5th of March, Western Front, um, if you need me. Otherwise, I'll call to check in as soon as I'm back. And now these functional kind of messages, of course, happen by text or email. Um, so it's always fun to see them in a postcard. Yeah. And one more great shot. Right. All right. Any more questions, thoughts, and then some nice press clippings. So these artist files are sort of like vertical files as well. You'll find um, a lot more, a lot of good contextual research was done on each artist. But yeah. So it's a big collection. It's got a lot of information. Any artist from the 70s to now basically from New York um, is probably present in here. Because again, it was such a simple format, um, two days, a bus directly from downtown to Cutstown, um, really facilitate. And then just a really passionate founder um, who was willing to reach out and build this network and this program. Um, so we're really grateful for this collection. Uh, I'll also say I did conduct James's oral history as well. So that's at the archives and is an amazing kind of gives you all the through lines of the papers in the in the oral history. Great. 
Well, th um, thank you again, uh, Josh, for doing this. And hello, James. And thank you so much for this great collection. Um, we appreciate you all joining us for this Unbox Lunch and hope that you will tune in on July 21st when our colleague Jacob will pre be presenting or unboxing um, a newly acquired collection. So thank you and have a great weekend.